Hello and welcome to the Parents' Guide. This is where you'll find out what's going on in schools and hear some of the key issues being discussed from the parents' point of view. If you have school-aged children, this programme is for you. We'll be focusing on English and Maths in primary schools with two parents, Amanda Blinkhorn and Stephen Blanchard. Hello. Hello. We're also joined by education consultant Bill Davis, who has a great deal of experience in primary schools. Hello. We've been looking at some programmes from Teachers TV and we'll be showing some extracts during our discussion. These programmes were made for teachers, but they also open up a window for parents to look into classrooms and see what's going on in schools today. In the first programme, we see how literacy is taught at Blue Gate Infant School in Tower Hamlets, London. Here, a reception class is learning to read using the basic structure of sounds and words called phonemes. <laughs> I want you to hear the middle phoneme, the sound in the middle. Not the beginning, not the end, the one in the middle. Okay, ready? Let's have mug. Hand up. Mariam. Ah. Very good, that's excellent. Can we all say ah. 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 Okay, good, lovely. So it's mug. Let's say it. mug. Excellent. That's the middle phoneme. Now, Teddy's going to say a word, but he's not going to say the whole word. He's only going to say the separate sounds. And you've got to work out which word he's saying, so it would be really clever. S, U, A, G. What is it? What is it? Somebody who hasn't had a go yet. Tasnima. Slug. Is she right? Yes. Slug. Let's see if you can all do that with Teddy. Are you ready? You ready with your arms? <clears throat> ah, good. Slug. Excellent. How many phonemes was that? Four. 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 Now you're going to show me how really clever you are. We're going to read some of these words. This one. Ah, 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 See if I've got a tricky one for you. Stephen, what did you think of that lesson? And more importantly, did you know what a phoneme was? I, w I was more or less aware of what it meant. I suppose it's a, it's a sound, individual sound, but it's, um, it seems very, very similar to what we did when we were at school, sort of sounding out words, breaking them into sounds. We didn't call it phonemes, but, but it, it was the same sort of thing. But I suppose, it, I suppose they're more conscious of what they're doing. Amanda, did you feel that that was something you understood immediately, the use of the, the concept of a phoneme? I'd, I'd never heard of a phoneme before, so I didn't know what it was, but I think... Like you say, the, you, you, the instinctive thing is just the same. It is you, mm. when you're learning to read or helping someone with reading, you break it down to those sort of sounds. Stephen, as a parent, are you aware of the balance between reading words technically and getting meaning from them, which is a sort of ongoing debate in the teaching of English, or certainly in an early stage? Yes, I am. It's quite, it's quite easy for children to... Um, to to sound out words or know how to pronounce words, but not actually, they, they have to put them in the context of a sentence or a book. They have to, so that the meaning rolls on and that, you know, it tells a sort of story. Bill, are you worried that it could be taught too phonetically and that children would be deprived of the, no, the meaning of language? Definitely not. I, I think that uh, teachers have had hundreds of hours of training and they understand the need for balance in, in exposing children to a range of opportunities and, and develop skills, a range of skills, so that they can actually apply those um, as they, they, they actually uh, develop their uh, understanding of the importance of language and the pleasure of reading and communicating. Mm. I think I agree with you that all of these strategies and, and, and aspects of, uh, teaching of the teaching of reading need to be uh, put into context, into real-life context, to give pleasure and meaning to what children 
are, are learning the skills that children are learning. And under, un underlining these various strategies have, have always been the use of reading schemes, which some parents like a lot because it gives them a, mm. a progression for their children, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, what do you feel about reading schemes? I think, from my experience, I think kids quite like it because they like, they're quite competitive and they quite like ticking things off. Well, maybe that's just me, but I quite, I quite like the idea of having gone through something. Stephen, do you remember a reading scheme when you were at school? Yeah, I remember the Janet and John books. <laughs> They were and pretty dry. <laughs> Amanda, do you remember Janet and John fondly or not? I, did, I remember. The only thing I can remember about learning to read is that it was a ladybird book and I got so frustrated at not being able to read this word that I, I scratched it out of the book. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. 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 So, um, but I don't, think that was, I don't think it was anything to do with that particular story. I just, it was the word here, H-E-R-E, yeah. -E, and I, I just remember not being able to get my head around it at all, so I thought, right, well, gouged it out yeah. I think, what that means <laughs> I think that that, that schemes of uh, the reading schemes uh, have been developed um, and are no longer perhaps as dull as they were they reflect real life often and uh, they have stories in them that children can relate to and um, also they reflect the multicultural aspect of our society and uh, which um, many children are not aware of because they they attend schools which are monocultural. Mm. That, that's an important point, isn't it? Because the reading scheme mm. can, in a way, be responsible for other kinds of education, not simply about literacy, more about inclusion and things. Is Absolutely. that is that your experience? Mm. That's true. Yes. Well, it's a long way from Janet and John, anyway, in the Ladybird books. And <laughs> in the next clip, we're going to go back to Bluegate Infant School to see a guided reading session led by literacy coordinator Leisha Jones. <laughs> be saying to them all the time okay it looks right because they're really good decoders but does it sound right is it good English have you looked in the picture look at them is there anything in the picture that tells you what is it look at the cot cottage have you heard that word before and ran does that word look right all through the school we do running records now that's looking exactly at what, at what the child's reading behaviour is, marked down on the page, what, re, what the text said, what their response was. Are they cross-checking? Are they looking at the word? Are they getting stuck on a word and then looking at the picture to see if yeah, they're right? It does, doesn't it? Can you go back and check it for me? Good boy. I think one of the key features you need in a successful school is that they track their pupils' progress rigorously. They know who's making appropriate progress and they know who's not and they do something about it early. I like the way you said the first word. Let's look at parts. In a beautiful... Good boy. How do you know it says beautiful? Good boy. So you looked at parts of the... Well done, Imran. Lovely big voice. Good. And what did we say that was? That was the mid... Good boy. Lovely reading. Amanda, what did you think of that? Did you think they were enjoying their reading lesson? They seemed to be, didn't they? And, and it was so impressive watching her being so on the ball to see what they were doing and describe what they were doing and praise them when they were stumbling and, and always reminding them of the technique so that if they, the point wasn't necessarily to get each word right, but that the process was what mattered and the fact that you could work it out if you had another go. I thought it was amazing to watch actually. Explain what guided reading is to us. I'm not, many parents might not understand what was going on in that lesson. It's an opportunity for a teacher to work with a group of children where they have a single text. They share. share. There may be eight children in that, in that group or five children. They will have the same book and they will read together and sometimes they'll actually read the book aloud uh, and take it in turns and around the table. So that's to read a different a strategy to the other ones we've talked about, phonics and books. So what, what's Definitely. the advantages of guided reading? Well, children actually learn from each other. Um, they have the opportunity to listen to each other and see how each other model the, the uh, strategies that they've been taught uh, at an earlier stage. But it also provides an opportunity for them to talk about the context of the story and the context of the words and to perhaps pause and say well what does that word actually mean in that sentence 
And how does that sentence relate to another? And that's the joy of actually sharing uh, literature with each other and sharing the excitement and the pleasure and actually saying, well, did you enjoy that story? And engage children in having opinions about literature. So that's an interesting idea, isn't it? Reading is a sort of social activity rather than a solitary one. You know, like Belle says, I, d I think they do learn from each other because they, you know, they're that much closer to it. And if one's mm. a little bit a step ahead, it's not such a daunting that's process. Strange. If you can see someone else getting a little bit further and then stumbling, that you know, you can see yeah. what's possible. But that might affect, for example, the way parents might read with their children if they knew that there was a different, more social way of doing it in school. Do you, do you think it would help for parents to be told a bit more about guided reading, for example, since it's obviously quite a popular strategy yeah. now these days? Well, it is. If you think about adults and book clubs, you think about the Richard and Judy syndrome and the impact that they've had on adults enjoying books. That's what's happening in classrooms on a daily basis. But many parents may not know that. That's regrettable. It doesn't take a great deal of effort to offer that to, to parents. Stephen, do you think the, ter sort of the term guided reading is a bit too technical for parents to understand? It, well, it, it is, yes. I, I didn't understand what it was before I saw that clip and Bill explained it. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very similar to the way parents read to their children at home. I mm. think the jargon is a bit of a turn-off, actually, because I, I, mean, I never really think mm. of it in terms of the, of the technical explanation. And I would never talk about guided reading. No. Can I just say that I think that one of the key things is that underlying that pleasurable experience is a very serious educational agenda, an agenda of assessment, of engaging with children, um, and, and really using that information and recording it mm. after the event mm. to track pupils' development in reading. Mm. So I think it's very important that it's not just perceived to be fun. Well, now we're going to look at some slightly older children and we're going to go up a stage to year six and see how boys are catching up with the girls at Ardley Green Junior School. In the extract, we see Louise Bartlett's class and a debate about fox hunting. The following people are for fox hunting. Adam is a dog breeder, Matthew the fox hunter and Race Farmer Jones. The following people... What tends to work particularly well with boys in getting them to speak is getting them to speak in role. So if they're not actually having to speak as themselves, expressing an opinion or an emotion, if they can do it through being a particular character or through being an interested party, um, then they're, they're much more willing to put themselves on the line. Matthew, why are you for fox hunting? Because there are thousands of foxes out there in the world and fox hunting is a very interesting sport. And plus, it doesn't harm, harm the foxes because it's only a little bite on the neck from the dogs. How do you know it doesn't hurt them? You're not being bitten on the neck by a dog. Thomas, why are you against fox hunting? I'm against it because the foxes, that it's just stress for them. And also it disturbs the wildlife and the na and nature. And the most important thing it disturbs is me. I hate it. The other children are asked to comment on the performance. It doesn't take long with other, other classmates as your critic saying, well, actually, I, I don't think you got anything done because you didn't use your time very sensibly before they actually think, no, we want to be praised by our classmates. Now, we've seen both sides of the argument. Now it's your turn to, to decide. Should fox hunting be banned? Stephen, do you think it's fair that there's generally considered to be a problem with boys when it comes to English? Well, I suppose if it's there in actuality, then it, it should be treated as a problem, you know, steps taken. But I, I sort of wonder where it comes from. It seems, it seems a bit sad if boys, you know, see... Uh, suddenly see themselves as being less able. Do you think that's... Of... Is that your perception as a parent of a boy? That they, no, that they do didn't, fall behind girls? It didn't, didn't seem an issue with, with him in particular, but I, I, I do feel it kind of sets in at some point after the, um, you know, primary school. It seems to be, you know, the late years of primary school and it suddenly sets in. The, the girls suddenly seem to be reading better. Do you, think, do you think it's important that parents do know there's a potential difference or should we all just be a bit more laid back about it and let them develop at their own paces and not worry so much that boys yeah. might be falling behind? Yeah, I mean, you can set yourself up for 
self-fulfilling prophecy. If, if you say, oh, well, you know, boys mm. are no good at reading, then I'll, you know, you're, you're either then going to be overly sensitive to, to looking for a problem and finding it. You, you know, you might be less encouraging. Bill, why do you think there is an issue with boys? Well, there is a real issue. Mm. And uh, I think it's uh, related to um, the physiology of the brain. One, it's one factor. And um, the development of, of language skills by boys uh, at an early age. But I also think it is the fact to do with the fact that, that boys like action. And did you think that role play example was a was a good way to get boys interested, or was that more to do with speaking and listening? I wasn't quite clear whether it was writing, I reading, think it, or speaking. I, it, it's everything. That that, that was a, a wonderful a wonderful illustration of uh, of how all those elements are brought together uh, to form a very um, realistic uh, and appropriate learning experience for boys and girls. Did you think that was good, Stephen, the, the role play, the getting the boys to speak? Yeah, it's, it seemed to energise them. They didn't mm. seem at all self-conscious about mm. it. And the, the, uh, it. It did seem to work. Bill raised an interesting point about boys and the, the action thing. Yeah. I mean, they, are, they do, without falling into sort of stereotypes, they do tend to be much more physical, especially small mm. boys. Yeah. And often it's hard to focus them on activities that involve sitting and listening. One thing about literacy is that we're in danger of over-romanticising the value of literacy for literacy's sake, because it's only mm. a tool, really, isn't it? Mm. It's reading and writing, which you have to learn to do, because otherwise you can't do anything. Mm. And that's what that clip seemed to be about. It was saying, let's not call it literacy, let's not call it, you know, reading and writing. Let's say we're going to do this. And, but in order to do that, you, ha you do have to sit down and write this down and read this and assimilate this information. OK, well, obviously, functional literacy is important, but numeracy is equally important. And next, we're going to travel to Jersey and Janvin School, where they've developed a technique for teaching fractions using paper cups. In the clip, we see Louise Isaacs and her Year 3 class. They've decided that the multiplication sign should be called Love That Number. Lauren, I'd like Jay to love that number three times. How many times have you been so far, Jay? Twice. Twice, excellent. How many times left to go? Once. One more. Okay. So, Jay, can you count them for me, please? Good, I am really impressed. As I'm talking, everybody else is getting on with writing this math story. When you've written this math story, watch what Jay is doing. With this type of approach, everybody can hang their hat on some sort of hook and doesn't matter how they view those cups, it's a very vivid memory that allows them to sort of move on to the next part of the lesson, even if it's not that day, it could be later that week or even later that term. Next, representing fractions with cards. But first, is there evidence that the teaching method is working? Well, I'm in the business of trying to raise standards, obviously, and I've found that mathematics has been very resistant to the standards being raised. So given that, we've been looking at other styles uh, of techniques, and we're finding that this particular style here has been working really well. We're going to use something that isn't cups, but it represents cups. So we have to imagine that we're using the cups this time, although they don't look like cups. But I need somebody who's feeling particularly brave to come and show us this math story using their fraction cards. Oh, oh, come on then, Patrick, out you come. Amanda, were you impressed with that way of teaching fractions? I love that. I could have watched that all day. It was fascinating, because I remember learning fractions about three different times and never quite getting the hang of it. Um, so I'd have loved to be able to do it like that. I thought it was brilliant. Just so simple. Stephen, would, would that have helped you learn fractions, do you think, in your yeah, school days? Yeah, I think we missed out all the <laughs> stages and it was just on, on the board. And it's, it's kind of, yeah, it gets, gets away from that abstract thing of, you know, plus and equal and division and just, in, just does it in terms of physical objects. And 
actually moving them from one table to another. Do you think that for some parents it might seem too simplistic to be doing it with a, a lot of cups? They might really want their children to be sitting down learning hundreds of fractions. Have you experienced that as a former head? Uh, yes, indeed, I have. And um, uh, it's uh, at the very early stages of my career, but parents would... Uh, uh, judge the competence of the teacher by the amount of maths in the books and the amount of books that their children filled in the course of a year. That's changed considerably and often today uh, children may record very little in a maths lesson uh, in the form of written uh, work but actually have engaged in really uh, practical mathematical experiences which they will remember and which they will be then be able to apply to, to simple recording, group recording, as a whole class, as a small group, in pairs, and then on their own. And uh, we should encourage that kind of, of teaching, particularly the kind of practical work that's there, because it actually leads to real understanding. And the gaps that we've experienced in our lives, um, hopefully, uh, will not occur in the future. That's a very interesting important concept for parents to understand. I mean, do you ever have moments of panic and think, why aren't they doing their rote learning of the times tables? I think you can get too worked up about it, really. I, d I mean, I don't really see how the schools, or why the schools should have to actively re-educate the parents. I mean, it's up to the parents mm -hmm. to either look back a few pages if they really don't know how to do it. Yeah. I mean, the schools have got enough to do with that re-teaching parents long division. I mean, I would, you, would you be there on a wet Wednesday to do your long division <laughs> class? I, I was given the opportunity and I didn't go, so I can't. <laughs> Have you sneaked into the W. H. Smith to buy a, you know, I, I, I have book been the reading shelf? these little books that they bring home, the sort of work, you know, work through books. And, uh, so you're satisfied that they are getting their entitlement to the sort of basic math mathematical concepts? I got concepts a bit anxious about this thing about um, the times table, you know, <laughs> learning that by rock because it seemed to me to be so useful, and they're, they're obviously struggling, you know trying to work out four times seven by adding seven lots of four together and it just seemed it just seemed more useful to have it at the, you know have it at, know it by rote and okay it's, Bill, it's... to defend the progressive <laughs> methods of teaching math do you think <laughs> do you think we need to rote learn to I, I do I think there's mm. a, I think I actually think uh, that there is a, to, to rote learn uh, with understanding of the uh, uh, of what you are actually repeating and I think that that's the key. In the next clip from Tayfant Community School in Bristol we see year four teacher Simon Mills teaching maths using computers. His first problem though is to stop the children eating the data. I think the challenge in mathematics generally is the language. I think what's really important is for children to be able to talk about and use the language because I don't think children are actually able to understand fully what the terms mean until they've had a chance to use it in conversation and to come to some kind of agreement themselves about what it means. ICT I see as a tool, it's a mediating tool and it's also something that allows the children to, to see results quickly, it allows you to, to, to do things that you probably wouldn't get done normally and one of the things you know that, that, that young children particularly find difficult with data handling is creating the charts themselves the computer produces those for them so straight away they're able to access the maths and they're not worried about presentation okay well let's have you on the carpet the children have used the ICT suite before but this is the first time they've come across this piece of software zero quickly before we go Put your hand up if you had exactly the same frequency of sweets inside your tubes. Nobody? Mm. It'd be impossible if you want it to be equal. It'd be impossible to have them all equal. Why do you think that? Um, because you can't just <coughs> get, um, like, five threads and five blues. So you think from the data we've got already, you think it's impossible? Yeah. <laughs> Amanda, that's a different way of teaching maths, using ICT. Did, did you feel maybe it was too much about the ICT and not enough about the maths, or did you think the balance was about right? It doesn't really matter, I suppose, because they've, they've obviously got a huge level of skill in the ICT, and then the maths seem to be being absorbed along in, in the whole process of it. So I'm not sure where the division lay, but they seem to be pretty good at both. 
by the end of it. Does it worry you, though, Stephen, those children haven't got the, uh, re the required ICT skills? They might not be able to access their entitled curriculum. Yeah, I, d I did get the impression that it was a bit chaotic in parts, that, that lesson. And there was, um, I suppose the children were helping one another, but they, they did seem groups that, that, you know, were really struggling and, th and that they, you know, it was acting as a barrier to them understanding the maths, the fact that they, you know, they couldn't open Excel or they'd lost their data or they, you know, they couldn't work out how to do the different colours. And it's, it did seem to be creating more difficulties. I don't know what the balance was, whether it, because I know it's very fiddly to do it by hand as well. Mm. Well, we do know, don't we, that there is an issue about some non-specialist ICT teachers using computers in the classroom and maybe not feeling confident themselves about it. Do you think that can be a problem? I think that le that particular clip, if we, if we reflect on what that clip, it was about exposure to, of those children to that software for the very first time. Inevitably, some children are going to struggle. And that's part of the assessment process for that teacher. And I believe, and I would hope, that that teacher following that lesson would identify the children who were struggling and actually enable them by perhaps pairing them with another child to gain those skills. Stephen, what do you think about the idea of more able pupils helping the less able? Does that bother you as a parent, or do you think that's a kind of nice thing for them to do? No, I, th I, think, it should be in, I think it should be encouraged because they... they they gain more confidence in, in their own ability and it's, I mean, it's, it's what happens in life outside school. People help one another and I don't think there should, should be this idea of, um, you know, children keeping their skills to themselves and, and sort of, you know, being a, in, in a state of rivalry with other children, competitive with I mean, this is all about a totally them. different sort of classroom management to the one that we had. Mm. How do you think parents can be confident that that really is raising standards when the same message you're getting all the time as well is they should all be sitting in rows and looking at a blackboard at the front? I mean, there is a school Is that the thought. message you're getting? Well, I think there is, in the media, there is a message that we ought to go back to more traditional methods mm. of teaching. What, what we saw there was, in, in effect, good social development of children as well as good intellectual development of children and uh, I think that for formality to be increased would actually work against uh, children uh, and their ability to, to develop those key social and, 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 and skills of good citizenship too. Mm. Okay well I think most parents would agree with that comment but we have to end it there. You can have your say though by emailing parents at teachers.tv and you can find all the information about programmes you've seen and more on our website at Teachers TV. Details at the end of the programme. Thanks to my guests, Amanda, Stephen and Bill. Goodbye. goodbye. And from myself, Fiona Miller, thanks for joining us. And until next time, goodbye.